Bill Kane, Hillary Kane, Elizabeth Warren Kane, Eric Swalwell Kane, and now this afternoon we have the distinct pleasure of welcoming Senator Bernie San Sanders of Vermont. He now has come to the West End, and we welcome him. But not only do we welcome him, we welcome everyone here who believes that health care is a right and not a privilege. We welcome everybody here who believes that education is a right for everyone and not just some. We welcome everybody here who believes that the Mueller report should be released to the public unredacted. If that's you, welcome. Let's give it up for the man at the house. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my distinct pleasure to serve as your moderator today. I'm Renia Jamison, and today we're going to have a very important conversation, a conversation about poverty. Now, poverty is defined as a means to not being able to make ends meet by what you have. But the reality is poverty is a grandmother who's struggling between whether or not to eat or to buy her prescriptions. Poverty is a father who's struggling to find a decent job so that he could take care of his family and feel like a man that he should be. Poverty is a mother who is struggling to come home and spend time with her kids and plan opportunities to educate her kids because she's working so hard just to make ends meet. Poverty is strangling far too many of our Americans. And in South Carolina, we know it's strangling South Carolina. The reality is, Poverty needs to end. This Friday, this Good Friday, as the pastor reminded me earlier, is a great day. It's a good day because we're together and we're going to talk about solutions to end poverty. And we're not just going to talk about it from the top down. We're going to talk about it from Greenville, South Carolina on up. Yeah, let's give it up for yourselves. And so on behalf of Working Hero South Carolina, again, Renia Jamison, your South Carolina State Director, welcome. Thank you for taking the time out to be a part of this very important conversation on poverty. At this time, I'm bringing to the stage our National Field Director from Working Hero Action, Lene Norwood. Welcome her from all the way, California. Welcome. How y'all feeling today? Uh, I think y'all can do a little better than that. How y'all feeling today? All right. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you on behalf of Working Hero Action. Um, my name is Lene Norwood. We are so thankful for you guys to be here today and embark upon this important conversation on poverty. Um, we are so thankful to the Senator uh, Sanders team, um, Dr. Cornell West, Danny Glover, and all of our panelists for taking time to just share their expertise and pr uh, perspective on this very, very important topic. Um, here at Working Hero Action, our mission is very simple. Our mission is to end poverty. Can y'all clap for that? And together, I think we can. Y'all feel like we can end poverty? Yeah. If everybody does their part, we can make sure that no family is going without. So just a couple of things in case you uh, weren't aware. Did you know that one out of two families uh, can't afford a $400 surprise expense? That's unacceptable. Um, that looks like a broken wrist, a few blown tires, a busted pipe in their home. Most family, half of our families are one crisis away from poverty. Um, most Americans are working very hard, harder than ever, and yet live with a constant worry about how they'll pay their, their bills. Um, it's time for like-minded folks like us to come together 
um, and settle for nothing less than to end poverty. So it's our honor to be here with Senator Sanders from Vermont. Um, we are thrilled to have you here and welcome you to discuss uh, this topic that couldn't be more important, economic empowerment. Uh, Senator Sanders, as you travel the state, I'm sure you are hearing a lot about the struggles South Carolinians are facing. So many people are working hard day in and day out to pursue their dreams. Moms and dads are working hard to give their children every opportunity. For many of us, affording the basics, food, housing, health care, and education is harder than it should be. Too many South Carolinians are working too hard yet struggle to get by. That's why here at Working Hero Action, we are doing what we can to make sure that we are helping working people, predominantly women with children. Now, you guys know uh, tax day just passed, right? And normally that's a stressful time, but with our uh, flagship policy, the earned income tax credit, what that does is that makes work pay for families who are working hard and not having enough money to make ends meet. Um, it's called the earned income tax credit. Here's how it works. If you're a low income worker and you file your taxes, you could earn hundreds, even thousands of dollars back. It's pretty simple and you can claim the credit year around before tax day and beyond. So if you have people out there that have not filed their taxes, they can still claim their earned income tax credit. Um, we have, four years ago in California, the earned income tax credit was not even in existence. Now, we, uh, Governor Newsom has just uh, put in the budget for a major expansion to put even more money back in working families. So our hope is to have the same success here in South Carolina and the other markets that we're in to make sure that we make work pay better. Y'all with me on that? All right. So please, again, thank you for your time, for being here in this conversation. Please stay connected with us. Please stay engaged with our work to make sure that we end poverty together. Thank you. And now I am very, very proud to bring up our National Policy Director, Carrie Harris. Can you guys give her a round of applause? Carrie has been traveling all around the country, up and down the hill, making sure that we're connecting with policymakers to constantly elevate uh, poverty and the earned income tax credit. Um, she's a champion for those who are going without, um, for those who are facing problems every day. And we're so happy to have her a part of our Working Hero Action team, along with Rania and our entire South Carolina team. Um, so one more time, can we show some love for Carrie Harris? So, you've heard a little bit about us. Now we're about to introduce you to our guests. Again, Working Hero South Carolina is here to end poverty. We want you to join us on this journey, but today we want to have a strong and important conversation. So, Carrie will serve and Lene will serve as our seat at the table, and I'll be your moderator. But today's going to be a little different discussion than what we typically hear when politicians come in the building. We're celebrating our local heroes. So, at Working Hero Action, we believe that Heroes are those who get up and go to work every day and work hard to take care of their family and improve our community. We've got those folks with us today. And they're not just working hard for their families, they're working hard for your families too. So each of our champions will be joined by one of our amazing guests. So we're going to present them and we're going to get this conversation started. Y'all feeling good about that? All right, so let's go. First up, we are going to have, coming to the stage, our local champion, Pastor Mills from Mount View Baptist Church, Urban League of the Upstate, and he is escorted by the acclaimed actor, Danny Glover. <laughs> we promise they're coming. Let's give them some love, y'all. All right. Next up, we have a champion, a freedom fighter. Her name is Tracy, 
and she is spectacular. She will be escorted by Dr. Cornell West. Let's bring them to the stage with some love. Our last, but definitely not least, our last wonderful panelists that are joining us, our local champion, Jerry Blassingame, who has been working to change this community from personal development, economic development, and he's got beside him none other than Senator Bernie Sanders. <laughs> Now, let me explain to you how today's courageous conversation is going to go. Very quickly, I am yielding my moderation skills over to none other than the senator himself. But before I do so, I would be remiss if I did not acknowledge the amazing local leaders who are taking the charge to transform our community. We have with us some amazing elected officials. If you are here, please stand so we can acknowledge you. So, the way this is going to work, I'm yielding my skills to Senator Sanders, and he will be our moderator. I will be quiet until I let you all know what our next steps are. Senator Sanders, take it away. Thank you all very much for being here today to discuss uh, some issues that are not talked about very often. And there are two issues that are in my mind. One of them is the issue of poverty in America. Not an issue that we talk about a whole lot. There are some 40 million Americans living in poverty. They're living in South Carolina, they're living in my state of Vermont, and they're living in every other state in the country. These are people who in the wealthiest nation in the history of the world have no health insurance and they are scared to death about what happens if they or their kids get sick because they don't have the money to take them to the doctor. And they are worried about what happens if, God forbid, they end up in the hospital because they can't afford a $20,000 bill and there will be financial disaster for their family. These are people, some of whom we spoke to this morning, a teacher in Greenville, teacher, who's paying 50% of her income on rent, 50%. When you spend 50% of your income on rent, you don't have a whole lot left over for other things. These are young people or middle-aged people who are paying off outrageous levels of student debt. And I talked to a guy from Howard University just a couple of weeks ago, teacher paying off $180,000 in debt. How do you pay off $180,000 in debt when you're earning a teacher's salary? Which means you're going to be paying it off forever. Talk to a young doctor in Burlington, Vermont, $300,000 in student debt. Dentist in Iowa, $400,000 in debt. We're talking to mothers who are desperately trying to find quality child care so they can go to work and know that their kids are taken care of adequately, and yet the cost of childcare is prohibitive if you're on a low-income job. We're talking to people all over this country who are earning eight or nine dollars an hour. How in God's name do you survive on eight or nine dollars an hour? We're talking to senior citizens in this country, 20% of whom are trying to make it on $13,500 or less. So what we do not talk about in Congress, and what the media doesn't talk about terribly much, is there are a whole lot of people in this country who are living paycheck to paycheck. 
scared to death that if their car breaks down or the kid gets sick, their whole life is in turmoil. Well, the time is long overdue when in the wealthiest country in the history of the world, we started talking about that issue. And the other issue that we don't talk about And the other side of the coin on that issue is another issue we don't talk about very much. And that is that in America today, you got three families who own more wealth than the bottom half of American society, 160 million people. You don't hear that on TV or in Congress too often. Where the top 1% owns more wealth than the bottom 92%. And at a time when in Vermont and South Carolina, you got a lot of people working two or three jobs, 49% of all new income goes to the top 1%. So those are some of the issues that I think as a nation we need to discuss. And today we are going to begin to do that. And I want to thank everybody who helped organize the event and thank everybody who was here today for this uh, discussion. Um, I'm not quite sure who's supposed to lead off. Ron, you, do we have a, you want to help me on this one? I sure will. Okay. All right, why don't we start off with Dr. Cornell West. As all of you know Dr. West. First, let me say I'm just blessed to be here. I'm here with my beloved daughter, Zaytun, with all of my brothers and sisters of all colors, yourselves, as well as those on this stage and especially my dear brother, Bernie Sanders. Oh, yes. It's, it's a wonderful thing to have a politician in high places who's still on fire for justice, who still has a fundamental commitment to poor and working people, not because it's fashionable and faddish, but because that's the kind of human being he chooses to be be committed to integrity, honesty, decency, and generosity. So when we talk about poverty, when we talk about wealth, we have to first acknowledge the centrality of the moral and the spiritual. And what I mean by that is we have to fundamentally believe that poor brothers and sisters of all colors, genders, regional identity, sexual orientations, religion, have exactly the same value as the well-to-do. That's a fundamental moral commitment. And the only way you can account for the level of poverty, one out of two black and brown children under six years old living in poverty in the richest nation in the history of the world, the only way you can account for that is a callousness and indifference, not just in high places, but even lukewarmness among the middle classes who are so preoccupied with their individual situation, they've lost sight of brothers and sisters who are in hoods and barrios and white brothers and sisters, red brothers and sisters on reservations, and then the decrepit school system, and then the indecent housing, and then unemployment, and then mass incarceration, and then the various attacks, and then the spiritual warfare. Yeah. The spiritual warfare, which is to convince them that lo and behold, they give up or sell out rather than straighten their backs up and fight for justice. That's what this campaign is about in general. I know we're not here to talk primarily about the campaign, because I want to salute the working hero. Uh, action you. and they're going to interview all the different presidential candidates that's fine but the litmus test is going to be how committed are they in execution not just pretty words not just discerning their deepest conviction about what the latest polls say but I'm talking about who are they really and who has been consistent? That's this issue of poverty and wealth as it relates to this election. And of course, that's one of the reasons why I'm with my dear brother, Bernie Sanders. We have a, a special guest uh, with us today. Uh, all of you know him as one of the great actors in modern American history, enormously successful actor. We've all seen his films. But many of you don't know that Danny Glover has been involved in the fight for economic, racial, and social justice yes, has, for his yeah. entire life. My pleasure to introduce Danny Glover. Yeah. 
And thank you all for being here. And I see the face of, of not only Greensville, South Carolina, but the face of this country, citizens in this country, who are taking on the responsibility that they must take on as citizens and what citizenship means, to be active citizens, to be here in the sense of creating systems of engagement that are sustainable and sustainable activism that's coming here right here. Let's applaud it. And certainly we, we're here and have this opportunity because we're going to be here anyway because we know the, the issues affect us here that affect you right here and us in the nation are the same issues. And the intersectionality between those issues is important to understand here. Whether it's racism, whether it's poverty, whether it's education, whether it is mass incarceration, all of those are central issues that we have to attack together in order to reshape this country in order to transform this country, we have to be right here today with this discussion and to take this discussion from right here at this moment where we are right now and take it not only here in South Carolina, but down to my mother's home state to Georgia and across the country, and up to North Carolina, up across the country. We have to keep talking and taking this message. And we have our brother here, our dear brother, Bernie Sanders, who is there who understands and is engaged right here in governance about how do we change this country, how do we transform this country. So I'm glad to be here with you today. And, glad, and, and this is, not, this is my, own, not my only visit. These are visits that are, that are many visits that I'll be here as we build this campaign and build a new, and, and new energy that's necessary in this country. Thank you so much for allowing me to be with you this day, today, this day, as we begin and continue the work that we must do, have to do in terms of every single issue that's on the table now, whether it's the environment and global warming, whether it's it how, how do we create a future for our children, how do we begin to, 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 to really realize the truth of what this country is. Baldwin said, when said Baldwin, James Baldwin said, as, when we cannot tell the truth about ourselves, we are trapped in it. And we need to tell the truth. We need truth, truth, truth selling right here. And we're here to be truth tellers here. Thank you so much. Thank you, Danny. Thank you. Our next speaker is Tracy Font, who is with the K. Young's People's Pantry uh, and a founder of that organization. Tracy. Being from a place of poverty myself, growing up in Detroit, Michigan, and seeing poverty firsthand, moving to Greenville, South Carolina, and even being in a position now where I can help people understand that poverty is systematic and that we must all work together. And now sitting in a room full of people who were involved in the movement from the 60s to now who understand that the system has not changed, so the mindset of the, of the people must change. Knowing that we must, as a people, be determined enough to take a stand and not look down on those who we view as smaller, or who are lesser than, that's right, that's right. but view them as individuals, view them as our fellow man and reach out to them and consistently help them regardless. Being from a place of poverty where I was a mother working minimum wage, raising four small children, knowing that at any moment my power could be disconnected, at any moment we could have no water, at any moment an eviction notice could be put on my door. Like I said, I speak from a place of knowledge because I've been there before. And I know that now we're in a generation, we're in a time where we need people, we need leaders who will stand up for, the, for us, for the many who are suffering. And now that I, I, I am in position to be a leader, to be a freedom fighter in this community, yes, yes. I stand with Bernie Sanders and the people here on this stage. And I say that we must continue to fight. And I appreciate this opportunity. Yes. Yes. Before I introduce Jerry Blasingame, I just want to say uh, to Tracy, we need millions of people like Tracy all over this country, black and white and Latino, who today are experiencing the poverty and the stress that Tracy talked about. And to get those people to understand there are reasons for that suffering. And that if we can organize together 
we can develop policy which alleviates those issues and create a very different kind of country. So, Tracy, thank you for your courage. Thank you. A true hero. I told you we had some heroes up here today. Pardon me? We got some heroes in here today. We sure do. And here's another one. This is, this is a panel of heroes. And, and I want to introduce a real hero as well, and that is Jerry Blasingame. Uh, Jerry is the executive uh, director of Soteria CDC, senior pastor of Soteria Christian Fellowship. Uh, Jerry, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you, Senator. Very, 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 very. So I'm here representing the over 70 million Americans who've been impacted by the MADS incarceration system, criminal justice system. Mm. There are 2.3 million people right now there are 2.3 million people right now in our jails and prisons. Poverty is the root cause of mass incarceration. I was raised in poverty. I was a victim of crime. My mother was murdered when I was five years old. I didn't even get an opportunity, no, growing up with no parents. And so I'm here to help change this system. When I was released from prison in 1999 from a 20 year prison sentence, God put something on my heart to start an organization to help those who've been impacted by the criminal justice system. Right now, we've impacted over 5,000 men and women in the last 20 years who have a criminal background. Men and women can come through our program, learn job training skills, uh, financial literacy skills, and we also have a micro enterprise where we tear down old houses and teach guys how to build furniture so that they're learning a skill. And when they leave our program, they're able to be a productive citizen. Some of them are leaving with college degrees. Some of them are leaving with home ownership. That's what it's about. We don't have to stay in poverty, but it's, it is systemic and we have to change it. And I thank God for this stage and for you. We're here to change. We're not gonna just talk about it. We're gonna be about it. And I'm not going to stop and until every person with a criminal background gets an opportunity to have a job or an education or a home. And every child in America who has a parent incarcerated has a level playing field because I'm tired of seeing the school to prison pipeline. I am tired of seeing that. And I believe that we can change America one person at a time. And so thank y'all. Thank y'all for coming. Thank you, sir. Appreciate you. Well, thank you, Jerry. Jerry, say it again. How many people have been impacted by the criminal justice system? There are 70 million people in America. Whoa. 70 million people. All right. So that issue of mass incarceration, the issue of criminal justice is an issue we have to talk about a whole lot. Uh, let me introduce Stacy Mills, uh, who is the president of uh, the University of South Carolina, Upstate uh, Greenville. Don't, don't get me in trouble. Not the All right. Of the he has not forget everything. <laughs> he just came in off the street. All right. Unemployed. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Senator uh, Sanders. I take my seat today not for selfish reasons. But I take this seat today for the 4% of full-time working Greenvillians who still live in poverty. Um, the myth in our country is that uh, people who don't work, who are lazy, are the people who are living in poverty. But there are 4% of the working class citizens in Greenville, South Carolina, who still live beyond, uh, below the, the poverty level. So today, um, I sit here for families who are still trying to make ends meet. And I'm not here for myself. I don't take the pleasure of being on this distinguished panel because I've done something great. But because I pastor the 111-year-old Mountain View Baptist Church that exists in this community to help people every week understand that there is hope beyond what the news cycle has to say. And so today, I appeal to you uh, don't walk away from the community organizations that work. There's a rumor that we're failing our community. 
And I believe that that's a plant by some ill-intended myth that wants to divide us, uh, whether it's coming from Pennsylvania Avenue or from Capitol Hill or wherever it is. But we believe in a government of the people, for the people, and by the people. And we're the ones in this community who can make a change. So I'm here to welcome these wonderful people to Greenville, South Carolina, and let's talk issues. It's time to begin rolling up our sleeves. I'm going to open it up, uh, Ronya. That's right. I'm going to open up the question. No, up. we're not. You no, got... we're not opening it up to questions, actually. <laughs> All right, we're keeping you, the discussion here on the panel. Y- you've got one more for- person that you've got to give the mic to. Okay. We've got Carrie at the table. Uh, oh, okay. Yes. Sorry. Okay, yeah. <laughs> no worries. No worries, Senator Sanders. Hi, everybody. I'm, my name is Carrie Evelyn Harris, and I'm the National Advocacy Director for Working Hero Action. You've seen me going around videotaping because it's important to us that your story be heard. We have these panels because you have to know you're not in this alone. When we talk about poverty, oftentimes in our nation, we're talking about what the government stamps as impoverished. Just to give you a number, they equate a family of four making less than $26,000 to be impoverished. To me, that's not poverty, that's destitution, meaning you don't even have enough money to take care of yourself and meet your own basic needs. But here at Working Heroes Action, we're changing that definition. Because we understand that right now, four out of five Americans are living paycheck to paycheck. That's poverty. That is poverty because at any given time, you are in a state of stress, worrying if you will be able to put food on your table, a roof over your head, keep lights on, send your children to the proper schools for the proper education, pay your premiums for your health care, your deductibles, your co-pays. That's poverty. And and I'm an organizer by trade, so I need you to understand this. I need you to look to your neighbor and say, neighbor, you are not alone. alone. No, I need you to dig deep and understand that you are not in this alone. Four out of five of you right now are living in a state of stress because you are worried about tomorrow. You are in poverty. Tell your neighbor, neighbor, you you are not alone. And we are changing this definition, and that's why we are here today. We are here today because no family should worry about tomorrow. When you are talking about minimum wage, here in this state, it's $7.25. $7.25 to buy an off-brand box of diapers for a child I know. I have a two-year-old. It will cost you three hours of pay here in this state. If you want to simply feed your child a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, to buy the peanut butter, the jelly, and the bread is going to cost you two hours of work. That's destitute. But you have to remember, just recently I was talking to a gentleman maybe six months ago who lived in a really affluent neighborhood. And he told me in confidence and said, Carrie, my car was repossessed. See, in low-income communities, people talk about it because everybody knows we're going through it. But he lied. He lied to his friends and neighbors and said, oh, I sent it to my daughter who's in college. But when four out of five Americans are suffering, living paycheck to paycheck, I guarantee you he's not the only one in the neighborhood that is feeling that way. And until we are open and honest about our experiences, the power structure that is holding us back will continue to remain in power and have us pointing fingers at each other. And as a result, we will never rise out of what is the new poverty level. And that is why we are having this forum. That is why we are inviting candidates. And we are telling you, like Dr. West down there said, we urge you to look with a fine tooth comb at every candidate's past. Are they just jumping on the bandwagon because it's the new thing that polls well? Or or have they continuously fought on the right side of justice every time, even when it wasn't the thing to do? The only way we rise out of poverty and move from just surviving to thriving is by realizing we are brothers and sisters in this fight. And realizing that even when there is, you happen to be that one in five who is making it, if you're in this room, you're our ally. Let's voice it. Let's let people know they're not alone, and let's do this together. So, this Friday is in fact good, as we know that it is. Mr. Glover, I got a question for you. Yes, yes. Who is um, Christopher Reeves known as best? What, what character did he play that most people know 
Who's that? Chris Christopher Reeves. Superman, what? Thank you for answering that question correctly. <laughs> I just Superman. took a guess. But go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I mentioned Christopher Reeves because he has an amazing definition or had an amazing definition of heroes. A hero, as he defined it, is an ordinary person who does extraordinary things. And today, we are blessed to have an entire dais of ordinary people who have chosen to step up and do extraordinary things. Let's give them another big round of applause. At this time, we're transitioning to you, our heroes in the crowd. I need my gentleman with my mic. Where is he? <laughs> All right, we need, we need that right on up front. And we're gonna start with the man of the house. So if you wouldn't, st wouldn't mind standing, Reverend Speed, they'll bring you a mic and he'll get us started. Thank you, my brother. First of all, I wanna say uh, hats off to the panel, uh, and in particular, the local panel. Uh, they do so much uh, within the city of Greenville uh, to make Greenville uh, better than uh, it, that it has been. And so, so I want to thank you. And I want to welcome you all to uh, ATC, the downtown church. Here we do a soup kitchen. Uh, here we do affordable housing. Here we incubate businesses. Those are the things that we do to try and impact poverty, along with the things that the people that the panel uh, does to impact poverty. And at the end of the day, we stand here and it's not enough. It is not enough. In Greenville, uh, you have to make $60,000 in order to live within the city of Greenville and live in a house that's affordable. So my question is this, Senator, what is your strategy, and you've heard this question before, what is your strategy uh, to redistribute the wealth to where it impacts at a significant level to change the lives of the people that I come in contact with every single Saturday and every single day uh, uh, in the ministry that we do here at ATC. Well, you know, Reverend, when you ask a question which includes the phrase redistribute the wealth, I think many of my political friends will get very nervous. Not me. And I'll tell you why. For the last 40 years in this country, as you well know, there has been a massive redistribution of wealth in the United States. Problem is, it's gone in the wrong direction. It's gone from working families to the top 1%. Roughly speaking, if we had the same distribution of wealth in America today as we had 40 years ago, the average family would have something like $10,000 a year more in income. But what's happened is the very, very rich have gotten phenomenally richer, middle class has shrunk, and you got 40 million people living in poverty. That's where we are. So what do we do? Number one, we're ready for a very radical proposal. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, not so radical, but... How about if in America you work 40 hours a week, you don't live in poverty? Four years ago, when I talked about raising the minimum wage to a living wage, 15 bucks an hour, it was considered to be a radical idea. Not anymore. Six states have already passed that legislation. Want to deal with distribution of wealth and decency for working people? How about the United States joining every other major country on earth and guaranteeing health care to all people as a right through a Medicare for all single payer program? Want to talk about poverty and opportunity? How about doing what many other countries around the rest of the world do? 
and that is making public colleges and universities tuition free. How about substantially lowering student debt for working families? How about creating up to 15 million jobs by rebuilding our crumbling infrastructure? And by the way, when I talk about infrastructure, we're talking about building affordable housing. And how about doing something that the President of the United States denies exists? And that is to understand that climate change is caused by human activity. It is a threat to our country and the entire planet. And that we can create millions of jobs by transforming our energy system. And last but not least, in order to pay for some of these programs, how about instead of giving tax breaks to billionaires and large corporations demanding that the very wealthy start paying their fair share of taxes. At this time, um, we have had some questions submitted from the audience. Now, again, as your moderator and the person that's working really hard to squeeze in as much of this great discussion as we can, please don't be angry with me. Um, we have to ensure that we get this conversation in, so thank you for those of you that have been brave enough to issue us your questions. We will address as many of them as we can, and we've asked you to write them down and leave them with us, and we will pass them along to the Sanders campaign. So if we don't ask it out today, we promise that he will see them. Fair? Does that work for y'all? Okay. So, first question we have received is from uh, Miss Littlejohn. She's right here in Greenville. I believe it's pronounced T Tanika, and excuse me if I've pronounced that wrong. This question says, what is the solution to combat gentrification in this exact area, West Greenville and the greater Sullivan area? I, I think he knows who is too. <laughs> and we'd love for you to chime in too, sir. So I'm, I'm happy to jump in on this, this question. Um, and I think uh, Pastor Speed also um, will chime in on this. Um, our churches in this community uh, have an opportunity to unite and purchase property and build housing in the community for the people that live in this community. Mountain View Baptist Church bought 25 lots on Cagle Street and Temple Street. 25 lots, cash. And we're not waiting for developers outside of the community to come tell us what we should build on our property. So we've decided that we're going to think this out we are master planning and we are building with our community in mind to include child development opportunities. Right now, our community is also having a dearth of child care. People who work every day are also concerned about how they're going to take care of their children. So this gentrification piece not only has to do uh, with where we live and how we live, but it's an opportunity for us to work where we live and live and worship and play and study and learn without having to send our children all the way across the other side of town to get a good education. Thank you. Senator Sanders, did you want to chime in on gentrification? Well, I, I think this is an issue, again, that we don't discuss enough. Believe me, it's not just a Greenville issue. It is a national issue. True. We're seeing community after community right. where rents are going way, way up, and people who are born and raised in that community can no longer live in it. And I know Danny Glover has talked about that in terms of where he grew up in San Francisco, and Danny may want to say a word about it. I'll tell you just a couple of tools. I mean, the bottom line is that we have to say, before we even come up with a solution, what we want. And that is that working people have a right to continue to live in the communities that they love and where they grew up. That's the basic principle. Now, how do you go about doing that? Well, when I was mayor of the city of Burlington, where we faced similar problems, we developed the first community housing land trust in the United States of America. That's an idea that has spread all over the country. And what that says is you will purchase a house from the land trust but you're going to sell it only at a 
marginally higher rate than what you pay for it. We keep it perpetually affordable. Second of all, if you are a developer coming in, you can't just do anything you want to do. You want to develop fancy housing, that's fine, but you're going to have to build a certain percentage of affordable housing. Thirdly, and I know this is a, a radical idea you know, for 2019, when I was a kid growing up in Brooklyn in a low-income uh, household, uh, my family lived in a rent-controlled apartment. All right? And I think that idea in communities around the country to say to landlords, sorry, you cannot just raise your rates by 20% a year, that people have a right to live in rental units which are affordable. So I think that's an option for cities around the country uh, to be thinking about. Those are some of the tools that might be on the table. Thank you. So we are at a point where um, we don't have as much time as I'd like to delve a whole lot deeper. So panelists, I want you to think about this. We are talking today about national policies and national issues and challenges that face all Americans. But we recognize that those solutions exist right here in our local communities. So especially our local champions, we want to start with you. Will you please close us out and share with us what are some of the champions, some of the work that you're championing that you want folks in here to know about and to join you on that crusade? So I'm going to close it out first. Let's hear our wrap-up comments. And again, I know we're all very disappointed. We're almost out of time. But we're going to have a quick round-robin wrap-up comments from our local champions. And Blasting Game, we're going to start with you. All right. Thank you. So as I mentioned, about 70 million people in uh, America or have some type of criminal conviction. Right here in Greenville, even in South Carolina, one in three people have some type of criminal conviction. So cr uh, criminal justice reform is big here because a lot of people who have a criminal background, there are 48,000 collateral consequences that cause people not to be able to get a job, move in a house, education. If you have a drug conviction, you can't even get a Pell Grant because of the 94 Clinton crime bill. We need to see people who are in prison get out, but not just get out worse than they came. 95% of the people who are in prison, they're coming home, they're gonna be our neighbors. And so we're sending them in prison, we're giving them long sentences with no rehabilitation. And they're getting out worse. So we need to think about that. And so we need to work on, you know, even expungement, uh, you, you know, our, we, we just passed a small expungement bill um, this year in uh, South Carolina. We need to expand that. Um, also, some sentencing reform. People are getting too long of sentences. A 20-year sentence. What can a man learn in 20 years that he could not have learned the first year while he's in prison? And so, you are the voters. You are the voters. Next year, we got another bill coming out. It's clean slate. It's automatic expungement. When a person, after three years, a person been out, they hadn't reoffended, they need, their record needs to be cleaned up with no fee. It costs $310 per charge, per charge. And so we need to see you talking to your senators and your, uh, your House members to vote these bills so that we can get our brothers and sisters and family members out here working. Because if we don't, their kids and their grandkids are going to be in prison just like them. Thank you. And you promise you're going to stick around. So if there's anybody that wants to connect with you, you're going to stick around, correct? I'm going to throw it down there to my freedom fighter. Go ahead and take it away, dear. And with Freedom Fighters Upstate South Carolina, we focus on issues of social justice, prison reform, homelessness, um, fair housing, equal justice for all, um, so many topics. And, and I agree with Jerry, um, the system of incarceration and reincarceration must end. But not only that, we must focus on the, the housing issue as well. When someone has a felony, they can't get a house, they can't get housing. Um, I get contacted on almost a daily basis by people who have something on their record from 10, 12, 15 years ago who can't get, get housing. We have to focus on affordable housing, actually, actual affordable housing though, for people who do not make $60,000 a year but want to live nice in a nice community. Right now, currently in Greenville, they're being pushed out due to gentrification, due to 
high, the high rent costs, the high cost of living that the infrastructure has designed in order to, to push certain families out. As a community, we need to understand that we need to show up more to county council meetings, to city council meetings. We need to use our voices. We need to stand behind those who are willing to fight for us, such as Freedom Fighters Upstate South Carolina. We must understand and not only know the word gentrification, but know what gentrification means. Know that there are people out here that are struggling on a daily basis. Know that there are red line districts that are right now being mapped out, that are being bought and sold by people who don't have your best interests in heart. And so in order for us to be a better community, we can't just sit back and allow things to happen. We have to stand up and use our voices and demand that we have fair housing, demand that we have level income, demand that we live above and what we, what we expect to get from this community. Because the issue, this, this is Greenville, like this is our home. But like I said, so many of us are being pushed out. So many are being pushed out because they don't understand what's really going on until it's, at, until it's too late. We're so behind, we're so far behind the ball when it comes to gentrification. We, it's, it's, it's nearly impossible for us to buy back a block now. However, we can invest in those who are truly trying to buy a block. We can invest and put our monies together and, and, and buy housing. And it doesn't just have to be in Greenville. It can be outside as well. But true ownership is what we need to focus on. We can't always focus on just being those who are renting and leasing everything. True ownership. True ownership will not allow us to be pushed out. True ownership is so, as I said, we need to educate each other in this community and we can't be afraid to show up and be educated on the things that we need to learn, the things that we need to know. Let's give it up for her. And before I go to our last local hero, Tracy, I want to throw it back to you just to give one quick 15 second plug for your pantry work. Can anybody oh, yeah. in here help you out and maybe donate some stuff to that? Oh yeah, we're currently uh, the K Young People's Pantry. We are collecting um, children's items. Right now, we are just servicing children. That's from newborn to, to teenage, 18, 19 years old. Um, we give items away. All items are given away free to victims of um, homelessness. Um, whose parents are incarcerated, whose parents are jobless, different things like that. So you can't just show up and get free stuff. There are, you know, certain elements that, that, you know, that have to exist for us to provide it for you. However, everything that's donated to the K Young People's Pantry is given away free to the community. And we appreciate Gerber and Target and all those others, and, and also the people in the community that have donated to the K Young People's Pantry. However, you know, as a community, we need for you guys to, you know, step it up and help us out a little bit more. Step it up, Greenville. Step it up. And now stepping on up to the mic to give his closing remarks is Pastor Mills. I do that often on Sundays as well. So um, mm -hmm. closing remarks are not hard in this audience. When I think about um, the next few months, um, June, July, August, tend to be uh, the toughest months uh, for me as a pastor. Uh, that's when we start burying people more often than we do at any other time in the year. And most of the time, those are young men. So when we think about the rates of incarceration in our community, put a face to it. At Mountain View, we're claiming this summer of 2019 to be the summer of sons. And we want our sons, regardless of what color they are, what background they are, to understand who they are, to rise up. So a few weeks ago, Jerry Blassingame came to our church. I moved the pulpit out of the way and I put two chairs up there and I took his book and I read it and I split it apart and I highlighted it and I asked him to talk directly to the audience about his experience. There are times when we need to pontificate and share the gospel from the mountain, but there are times when we need to come in the valley and live where people are and that's what we propose to do to help people understand that they matter and that our community can only be reclaimed when we stop putting on and start being about the real business of helping people rise up and become the best people that they can possibly be. Yes. And at this time, I'd like to turn back to our national guests, Mr. Glover and Dr. West. Could you please share some closing remarks for the people in Greenville? about this poverty conversation we're having. Well, I, I tell you, just, just to say with all my heart, I'm, 
when, when Einstein said imagination is more important than knowledge, he's talking about the imagination that men and women, citizens in this city, bring to the issues that affect their lives collectively. And I hear that in the voices that are right here in this audience right now, and I know those voices resonate across this city as well. How do we begin to marshal up our energy, our passion, our imagination to make the ch changes that we know are necessary? And where do, we, where do we put our voice and who do we put our voice behind? Who are the truth tellers in this community that resonates with citizens in this community? Who are the truth tellers who are able to now connect what they do right now in this, in this community on a national level? This is what we're talking about. This is the kind of transformation here. And it starts right here. It's been happening. It's been happening. It hasn't always been acknowledged outside of where it's happening, but it's being, uh, being acknowledged right now. And we're going to carry these voices, right only, not only in South Carolina, but across this country as we move into making and changing and transforming this country in the way we need to do. Thank you. And Dr. West. Yeah, I would say to my brothers and sisters of all colors here in this magnificent state of South Carolina, I challenge you, can you meet the standards of the great ones who have already come out of this state? Do you really know who Robert Smalls was? The, the creator of the first public school system in the whole nation. Right here. Because he had an understanding of greatness. Somewhere he read, he or she is greatest among you will be your servant. We'll focus on the least of these. We'll focus on those catching hell. Do you really know who Marion Wright Edelman is? South Carolina. Yeah. The great prophetic voice building on the legacy of Fannie Lou Hamer and Ella Baker and Martin Luther King Jr. and Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel still strong at 79 years old in a city that used to be chocolate called Washington, D.C. Do you really know who Jesse Jackson is from this town that this magnificent vanilla brother named Bernie Sanders stood with a chocolate brother named Jesse Jackson in 1988 and said we need to talk about poverty we need to talk about wealth we need to bring all of us together no matter what color because we have a commitment to integrity and principle and we're concerned about the least of these but you have to have courage We've been living in our age for 40 years where too many folk are still are scared and intimidated. Walking around laughing when it ain't funny and smiling. When... You got to straighten your backs up. You got to call into question some of your milk toast centrist leadership who's not telling the truth and say, we have voices too. We concerned about something too. And if you really have that kind of care, you really have that kind of concern, then you have courage, then you have a moral consistency. What I love about this brother is not that he's a God, not that he's a deity, he's a human being trying to be morally consistent and bear witness in such a way that he can bring us together and change this nation. That's what we're talking about. That's, what talking about. That's Brother Bernie Sanders we're talking about. That's Brother Bernie Sanders we're talking about. So Senator Sanders, you are our last guest. So, so Ron, you're asking me Sorry. to follow that. <laughs> Thank you very much. That's the company you keep, sir. <laughs> I, I just um, want to thank uh, Dr. West and, and Danny Glover from coming. Uh, Dr. West is at Harvard, and Danny came from, I think, San Francisco. And to also say, man, you got a fantastic group of local people here. Yes. You really do. Yes, yes, we do. Yeah. 
And I want to thank, this is a great panel, and I mean that very sincerely. And, and what I am deeply impressed about is, and, and people up here have said it, is that too often in this country, when people are suffering, when they're working for eight bucks an hour and they can't afford health care, they can't afford child care, where they're old and they can't afford the medicine that they need, they think they're in it alone. And that's a myth that the political system and the media tells you. You're not in it alone. You are part of the vast majority of the American people who are struggling hard to live with security and dignity. So what our job is, let me conclude on in this way, without being overly political. Well, I guess I'm going to be political, but what can I do? I am a politician after all. Is we got a president who, among many other things, wants to divide us up. All right? This is a guy who led the so-called Bertha movement, remember that? To delegitimize the first African-American president in our history. Busy attacking Muslims now, busy attacking Latinos and undocumented people. He's trying to divide us up based on the color of our skin or where we came from or where we were born or our sexual orientation or whatever. But I believe from the bottom of my heart that if we do not allow Trump and his friends to divide us up, but if we stand together as black and white and Latino and Native American and Asian American and straight and gay and native born and immigrant, if we stand together and keep our eyes on the prize, and the prize is a decent life for all Americans in the wealthiest country in the history of the world, if we do that, brothers and sisters, there is nothing we cannot accomplish. So thank you so much for allowing me to be with you today. Ladies and gentlemen, did you enjoy this conversation today? Well, I've got some quick ways for you to continue joining us on this journey. I want to make sure that first, we let you know that you can continue hearing from these amazing national folks right down the road. Peace Center tonight at 5 o'clock, there will be a rally for the Senator Sanders campaign crew. Join them and you can hear more and connect with them there. We've got to let them go, but beforehand, I want to have everyone on the dais join us for a couple of quick shots. And as everybody stands and we take our final pictures together, I want to tell you how we can continue this conversation. Ladies and gentlemen, if you did not know, today's hashtag was working hero poverty talk. I will repeat that. It is hashtag working hero poverty talk. We want to see your pictures. We want to see your videos. We also want to have you to continue to join us. You should have received a card that shares with you how you can stay connected with Working Hero and our work here. This is just the beginning. We got more work to do, guys. And I need each and every one of you to put your heroic capes on and join me in the journey. So text to, to this number, 31996, the words E-I-T-C. We want you to text to join us on this journey. The words EITC stands for Earned Income Tax Credit because we'll continue to be talking about that throughout the state. 231996. Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes our time today. Thank you. Thank our guests. Thank the amazing hard work of our great local folks. Tiffany, Jessica, we've been getting it done in South Carolina and we need to make sure we do it more. Thank you all.